love this pulpit. It has a little sign that says, do not lean on me. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to be the guy that forgets that so today. Um, I don't want to kill a pulpit. Uh, but it's good to be with you guys, uh, definitely. I am. Uh, I, I guess I'm the one who, who drove pretty far to came from Winter Park to be here tonight. And uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys. Um, John and Mia are dear to us. Um, not only do we work together in ministry, I'll tell you more about that in a few moments, but, uh, but they're friends. They're friends. They're, they're our kind of people. And uh, it was instant. Matter of fact, on my first Sunday at the church we are at, I saw him from across the room, and it's going to sound a little weird until I really explain it. Um, but I walked up to him, and I don't do that with anybody. And I said, I, I, I just like introduced myself to him for some reason. I don't know why or what, and but I did, and he felt awkward and things and stuff. So, but we became great friends, and, and we we are we buddy around as couples, and and it's a that's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Um, I am uh, uh, I don't even know what my title is anymore. I am responsible for the main campus of the One Church Network. And I serve the One Church Network in our church planting processes uh, and uh, what we call our central lead team. And we have a vision of planting 100 churches in the central Florida area in the next 10 years. And we're seeing God do amazing things. Um, we're using the I-4 corridor 50 miles north and 50 miles south from Tampa to Daytona as our region that we're going to plant 100 life-giving Jesus preaching churches, and um, we're going for it. We don't have any money. We're going for it, and uh, we're just crazy enough to think. You know, there's there's a spirit that church planters have. It's like it's like when you load up a Conestoga wagon and head toward the West Coast. You just you just go. You're a pioneer. You, it's crazy. There's no real net to catch you. Um, our story is exactly that. We, uh, my wife and I were youth pastors for about 17 years, and we uh, had, some, had some great success in youth ministry, had some of the nation's largest youth ministries, and had a lot of exciting things happen, watched a revival sweep through um, a whole generation in a city, and uh, just some cool things happened. And one day we really felt, uh, we were in Austin, Texas as youth pastors, my wife and I really just felt, wow, it's time to plan. Are you guys okay with me again? Yeah, all right, all right, right on. I'll turn every once in a while. Um, but we just really felt, we, uh, it's time to start a church. How do you start a church? I don't know. And we connected up with uh, the Association of Related Churches, and they're a life-giving kind of place. And they had a vision of 2,000 churches by the year of 2050. And we were church launch number 23 for that network of church launches, and we landed in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, just like our youth ministries were, we did not really draw the golf playing, pleated pants wearing crowd. Nothing wrong with those folks. We drew, we drew John. We drew John, and we were good at drawing John, and and it's, it's exactly what God was doing in us and through us. We wanted a place that was down to earth and real. Spoke to folks about Jesus in a way that they got. So that they would have a passionate relationship with him. That he wouldn't be some off in the distance kind of ethereal belief that grandma had. But that they could have him impact their lives the way that he impacted your right creek is right there, isn't it? I found it. Um, yeah, that, he, that Jesus could impact their lives in a real and an actual way. We went there, and we had uh, an amazing thing happen in that church. We got a very involved in the community. We wanted to be known for getting cars to single moms and washers and dryers to people. We wanted there to be such a practical action to our faith. So we stayed mobile for eight years. We set everything up before service. We tore everything down after service. And so we did that to keep our overhead down so that we could be givers as a church. Uh, right about that time, the, uh, the hit that happened in 2009, the financial challenge that happened nationwide really took its toll on us. And by the time we started ticking through 2012, 
we just we were a large church of about 350 people, but we could we were self-sustaining financially anymore. And the punchline to the whole thing is in 2012 we lost everything. We lost a beautiful home in a gated community. We lost vehicles. We lost we lost we lost everything. I can't express to you how everything everything really means. But there's something about saying yes to what God tells you to do that whether Paul says it, whether I'm in a place of blessing or in a place of need, whether I'm in a place where, where things are going good or where they're not going good, I've learned to be content because in my heart I've said yes. So stuff doesn't matter anymore. Amen? What's good about that is I've, I've died with some stuff. I lived in a gated community with a guy that let us in every time we drove home. I, I lived in a beautiful place. And, and we lost it. And I would lose it like that again to do it again. I'm dead. Sometimes to have you go, okay, this is what really matters. So in 2013, we moved to Orlando to potentially start a church downtown Orlando. I connected with a pastor who used to be my pastor when I was uh, in middle school. We went to church, used to call, used to call the Iowa Assembly at that time. And I was in middle school, I went there, I graduated from that area, and, and uh, he came back. Because my parents attended this church. My first Sunday there, the pastor wasn't even speaking. I really only knew him by name. Uh, but he had a guest speaker in who was a prophet. Now, I might have cynic tattooed somewhere on my body. And I thought, a prophet. A prophet. Here we go. But I sat in this service. And you guys probably were there at that point. I sat in this service as this prophet began speaking over the calling of the church. And the cynic in me melted. The hard-hearted, kind of seen it all, done it all. I've been on Christian television all around the world. I, I, man, I've played that game now. I, I, but in this service, as this man spoke about the mantle that God has over Orlando, I started weeping like a baby. I was uncontrollable. My wife and I were sitting about eight people apart because we had a lot of our family with us and everything. I looked down and she's weeping on the other end of the aisle. We never went to another church. We never visited another place. There's some rock star places in Orlando. We never left. Eventually that pastor handed me that campus uh, so that the apostolic calling on his life could be acted out. Um, I used to run the hallway because of zit face with Jude's junior higher. And he handed it to me. Now, especially for those of you who are going, you guys kind of know a little bit, but those of you who go to the church, you, you see this in acting out in, in, in a slow way. But in this crowd, I can say it that way. As we were waiting, I was traveling, speaking at places in order to have an income. And I would literally fly in on a Saturday, speak on a Sunday morning, they'd take me out to lunch and hand me a check, and I'd fly home. And I would twiddle my thumbs. That's not a scriptural word, by the way. I would twiddle my thumbs Tuesday, Tuesday through Friday, going, what am I doing? Am I flying to Denver to speak for 45 minutes? And I was going nuts. I'm a builder that, that Church planters are builders. They've got to, they've got to build something. They've got to go after something. They've got to create and build people and build teams and it had impact in the city. And I was going nuts. And I said, Lord, I want a project. And, and I, I, he reminded me of a series that I wanted to turn into a book. And I spent some time writing Weeds of the Mind. Um, it's just an illustration. One time while I was picking weeds how I realize our thoughts oftentimes overtake, I'm sorry, wrong thoughts oftentimes overtake the way that we think. Like weeds can take over your yard. Um, I 
I am, I am a, a, a relatively OCD lawnmower. Uh, I've always taken pride in my St. Augustine graphs and, and all of it looking good. I rent a house right now. I, a lawn guy cuts my yard. I can't even live out this book any longer in my, yard, my own yard. Um, but I uh, but wrote this book. And John asked me specifically to bring you a few thoughts from this book tonight. And uh, I, I like what God's done with it. I like what God's done with it. And we've got a box of them over there, over there. John can tell you a little bit more about that um, in a few minutes. But uh, what I wanted to kind of connect with you guys tonight is about something that came out of that book. Um, and and I'll, I'll get to that in just a few moments. Let me just jump into it right now real quick. <clears throat> right thinking matters. We've been called to live with the mind of Christ, to have the mind of Christ. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like my thinking quality is about a million miles away from what the mind of Christ really is. There are times I go, Lord, I'm still so far away from what you intended for me. But right thinking matters. The way that we think matters. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, oftentimes in Scripture, you find that a couple of words can be interchanged. And I feel this verse is one of those examples. And you could say, as a man thinks in his mind, so is he. As a man thinks in his mind, so is he. So, you are looking at me, and you're, you're, you've, you've made your mind up a little bit about me already. Okay, I, just, I know. It. You, you, it's just the way we are. You've kind of this, and all of this, and how you... You know, skinny jeans, you know, and all that kind of thing and stuff. And, okay, and so, but, but so you, you, you kind of determine some things right away. That's just human nature. And you can, you, can, you can hear me speak tonight, and you'll hear some of my story, and you'll hear some of the way that I present and stuff, and, and you'll, you'll define Aaron Maynard a certain way. I understand that. If I took you out to lunch, and we spent two hours, and we ate, and we shared even further, you'd know that much more about me. If we spent 12 hours locked in a room, you'd be tired of hearing about me, but you would know even more. But you still would not know me in my fullness the way God knows me because he knows every thought that I think. You'd still not know as if I were walking around with a screen hanging around my neck that showed you every thought as I was thinking it. That'd be spooky to have that. <laughs> Some folks are like, man, I'm glad that's not real life. <laughs> but, but when you think about that, that then you'd really be seeing. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You have only one way you're defined according to Scripture. And that is the way that you think in your heart. You will judge other people by their actions, but you judge yourself by your intentions. Let that rest. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And furthermore, later on, Jesus says, everything that is in you that the Father did not plant must be pulled up. Every thought, every motive, every intention, every time we manipulate a conversation... Come on, somebody, say amen on that. It's real life. Every time we do something that we feel that we've hidden well or that we feel we've, we've masked well is still truly defining the way that we really are. How much do we need our mind renewed daily? It should cause us to have a posture, bow down, saying, Lord, continue. Never to have a, a strut in our step. Never to take pride in how much we think we know Scripture. Never to go ahead and act a certain way with haughtiness, but to have that be such a, a humbling way to view our walk with God. Oh, Lord, you know my heart. Oh, Lord, work in my heart. This is, this is the way that Jesus worked in us. 
his whole ministry was like this. He said, you've heard it taught in the past, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already done it. He wasn't looking to get us squared away on the outside. He was looking at it straight for the heart. He says, you hear that it said, do not kill or, or do not murder. That's the old law. He goes, but I say to you, don't have anger in your heart toward your brother. He starts nailing these issues of the heart. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And he says, I want to get the way you is better. Bad English, I understand. <laughs> I understand. One of the things that uh, kind of jumped out at me as I was writing the book, and it's one of the chapters of the book, and I think it's applicable to every human being, uh, is the thought process of worry. Sometimes when we think through that worry style of life. You know, I'm, I'm five foot nine on my best day. I realize I will never be an NBA all-star. I, I, I understand that. I, I am about 160 pounds, maybe. Um, I will never be a great and champion sumo wrestler. Okay? I just know these are things. But what I do know that I am world class at, what I can make the Olympic team at, is worry. I can spend whole nights looking at the ceiling, concerning myself with something that hasn't fully happened yet. Anybody else? In, in, in? Okay, good. Right on, right on. Good. I like you folks. I like you. So here are a few definitions of worry. I'm going to write a couple of things down. Um, you know, look, we're not going to swim deep tonight. We're going to swim real. Is that all right? Is that good? Or you guys are intellectuals and everything, and you need to be impressed by Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff. We're going to swim real tonight. I want to tell you a few things about worry. Um, worry is all about things that might be. Worry is all about things that might be. Um, worry is based on a measure of truth about a factual circumstance that gets inflamed by adding potential circumstances and things that have not yet happened. Let me tell you what I mean. Has anyone ever received in the mail that little card that you ripped the side off from your bank and it says you've overdrawn? Everybody ever, ever received that? You feel, and so you open it up and you realize, oh my word, that was my car payment that I was trying to make that payment against and I've, over, I've bounced that check. So it's a fact you overdrew. It is a fact that when you were paying a $200 car payment, you only had $175 in the bank, you overdrew. The whole payment didn't go through. It's a fact. It's, it's a real fact. So worry is when you take a little bit of a real fact and you start adding things to it, making it bigger. That's where the term making a mountain out of a molehill came. You will spend time and energies saying, Oh my word, it's bad enough that I bounced the check, but now my car payment is late. If my car payment is late, I can't make it to work on Monday. If I don't go to work, I'm going to get fired. If I get fired, then they're going to come repossess my house and my car and everything. If, I get, if that happens, I'm going to go to jail and I look horrible in an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> you can take it all the way by adding things to it. Everybody does this. Everybody does it. We take a bit of the facts, and we keep adding to it. And we start this cycle, and we start this process called worry that has never been the heart of God for the believer. It's never been what God wants for us. Like I said, I do it wonderfully. <laughs> Another definition. Worry is an internal battlefield of the mind that undoubtedly affects the physical body, it affects external relationships, and it interrupts the healthy thought patterns and our outlooks on life. It affects the physical body. My grandma used to say, well, I was worried sick. Yeah, and it really became that. Then it really, I, I worried myself right into a headache, a two-day headache. Or, or it starts affecting the relationships around us. You find that you're living worry, you're talking worry, you're thinking worry, everything becomes, until all of a sudden you're the drama pimple that somebody wants to pop. Everything
everything about you. Everything going on, you are the one nobody wants to bump up against. We all have them in our family, right? You, you thought of a face when I said that. I, got my, I know exactly who I'm thinking of. Um, and then lastly, it jacks with healthy thought patterns on our outlook for life. If you're worrying, you're not having vision for the future. If you're worrying, you're not building toward a healthy future. And that matters. Last definition is this. Worry sets effort, brain energy, and affections and attentions on things that we might not have any control over at the times that we can't do anything about it. You can't control the weather. You can't control other people's reactions to something that happened. And worry oftentimes tries to assign a responsibility to something you have no control of. And it spirals out of control. It spirals into a dangerous place. As a matter of fact, right now, our thinking is a direct result of what we've been through and how we've responded to it. The way you think today is because of everything you've lived up to this point and the way you've responded to it. I've got work to do because of what I've done like that. I'm sorry, this is the last one. Here is the last, last definition. Worry is when we bow down and worship the throne of what hasn't actually happened yet. Well, now I'm a believer. I don't bow down to any throne but Jesus. Well, that's wrong. Anytime you spend efforts and energies, you are giving of yourself to a God that's a false God. We don't like to hear that because we like to think we're super Christian. But when we worry, we are bowing down before a different God. Wrong God. And it's not healthy for us to do that. Well, what's interesting, I said earlier I could be a champion a worrier. Well, the facts are, and I've lived a couple of, I'll be 44 next week or soon, I and um, I, uh, I've seen a couple of things. But I've realized I've not been right on most of the things that I worry about. All that time, all that effort, all that effort, what if this? What if they do this? What if that happens? What if the bank this? What if? And all these what ifs, I was wrong on almost everything I've ever spent time worrying on. Isn't that hilarious? So I'm really not that good at it. So much gets spent on worrying. If you've ever uh, lost sleep, if you've ever freaked out, you're in good company. David, King David, spoke of his tears drenching his pillow because of his sin in his life. Worry. He was, he was turned inside out, as it were. Can you imagine Noah having to explain to people why he's building this boat? His reputation is shot. He's having to explain it all. Can you imagine Mary? The first time she says to Joseph, Hey, honey, funny thing. <laughs> Pregnant. Can you imagine the kinds of things? People? So you're in good company if you've been to a place where you've worried and you've, you've, you've been frazzled, you, you've paced the floor, you, whatever, however you react, you're, you're in good company. Like that. But in each scenario and in thousands more throughout time, God begins to speak to the situations, oftentimes in the middle of the situation. If you'll throw the brakes on for just a moment, and in each of the times that you know you've lost it, worry. Because you know the inventory of your life, you probably can know and you can see watch God put his fingerprint on the situation. You probably know the details that maybe average folks who know you didn't see. He's worked in our lives. He's worked when we needed him to. You know, one of the areas of scripture that I, I think of and I, I, I think of when I, when I need to hear this is in Mark chapter 5 and it's an amazing kind of set of stories real quick. If you've got your Bibles uh, or your phones, you know, whatever works. Um, uh, Mark, Mark chapter 5 is a fantastic set of stories 
Yeah, Mark chapter 5, verse uh, 21. It starts two stories, and I don't know why this is like this, but it's two back-to-back, -back. it's actually not back-to-back, -back. it's a sandwich, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Oreo cookie of a story. And it starts in verse 21 with a guy named uh, Jairus, and Jairus, and we'll read about it in a second, Jairus was high up in the church leadership of the area. We'll get to him in a sec. I want you to envision a crowd. Um, a crowd a lot bigger than us, a crowd of probably a few hundred people. Imagine this room, wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder. It's tight, it's sweaty, folks are kind of milling around in the dead center of the room. is Jesus, and he's laying hands on the sick. He's speaking some things into some people's lives. Folks are standing up on the sides, looking in. I mean, man, the crippled leg got straightened out yesterday. I'm going to see if something great happens today. Or, or, or I brought my little son who needed a touch from Jesus. And assigned to that room some chaos. Let, you know, what you see needs to involve some chaos. And you need to see his disciples kind of doing their best to maybe give him a couple of feet of space or something, and, and just, just know that it was a little bit of a rough situation. And then coming through the door, or maybe it was outside, comes Jairus. And Jairus probably had a couple of folks with him, because he's that kind of a guy. He probably had some stature. He got his, his, his little entourage, his, his dudes with him. And as he begins walking, he's recognizable. Maybe even, maybe even the crowd parts a little bit. Maybe even he has the juice enough to walk directly right to Jesus. And it's interesting because with all of his power, with all of his notoriety, with, he probably made a couple bucks too. He probably was pretty wealthy. It, with, with all of this, he still had a need. And these stories that are sandwiched together like an Oreo are centered on people having a need. It's the foundation of where worry comes from, is you're in a place where life has come at you fast and you have a need. You have something that has caused you to think differently than that life-giving, positive way of thinking. Let's pick it up and see what it says here in verse, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over uh, by boat to the other side, I might be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you do that? Thank you. Good, good, good. I thought I could do it, but this Bible is like a six font here. Um, and if I hold it any different, yeah, it's not. I, I went and got a, I went and got contacts that are five focal contacts. Third, How weird is that? Third slider. They, yeah. It, I mean, I, yeah, it's third. wild because they have different thicknesses. Center and the, love it. Perfect. Perfect. Right on. Right on. You know, this is, this is better. All right, here we go. Here we go. We'll go back with it. Go back with it here. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. While he was by the lake, one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. And seeing Jesus, now oh, look at this. He fell at his feet. He fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him. He says, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with them. Look up here in Texas for a second. Jairus' daughter, 12 years old, was dying. Jairus was on a mission. Get to Jesus. He may or may not have been a full believer totally. I don't know what his interaction with Jesus was, but he knew that this was at least a chance for what was going on at home with this 12-year-old daughter. Maybe this guy who has laid hands on the blind eyes and seen him recover, maybe the guy who's speaking about the kingdom, maybe the guy that's doing this stuff, maybe this guy would possibly come see my 12-year-old daughter. When parents have a sick child, they'll do anything. Let me, let me drive that point home real quick. We have three daughters, three teenage daughters. They're beautiful as you could ever imagine. 
I know every dad says that, but they really are beautiful. Um, our middle daughter, Sarah, she's 19 right now. When Sarah was three months old, I mean, we're just talking about bringing the new puppy home. Well, Sarah was our first new puppy out of the thing. You know, I mean, we were like, baby, baby, goes, yeah, yeah. And, but at three months old, she got viral meningitis. And her brain swelled. She got a significant fever. We had her airlifted over to our Palmer Children's Hospital. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was getting bad. They said, uh, they said, this is bad. We need to prepare you if this is bad. So my wife and I, we'd driven from the coast, and we went over there to Orlando, here to Orlando, and, and they, were, they were talking with us, and, you know, 2 in the morning, we're meeting with doctors, and they said, we've got her up in the, in the, the ICU unit for the babies, and uh, we, you know, what do we do, doctor, and everything? And he said, we've got to watch her for a couple of days. Just stay here. Move your life over here for a couple of weeks. You're going to need this time over here while we watch her. We're horrified. They said, you know, it's totally possible that she loses her hearing, she loses her sight. It's totally possible that she becomes severely um, mentally retarded. You need to be preparing yourself for this. Well, as believers, we were going, you know, we were wrestling with faith versus what the doctor was saying. We were really wrestling with it. And I remember the next morning when the sun came up, we were still awake. And uh, we had our two-year-old oldest daughter with us. She's 21 now. Um, our two-year-old oldest daughter was with us, and we needed to let her smile. I mean, she's in the hospital with us and all this stuff, so we took her down to this amazing play skate that's down there at the bottom uh, of the hotel. And uh, we're down there watching her do the slides, and you know, Susie and I are almost asleep on the bench. You know, we're just worn, worn out, whooped. And as we're there, a mom wheels up a child in one of those elaborate and all that stuff. And the child is significantly um, twisted up and, uh, and obviously blind and obviously deaf and dumb. And quite frankly, you just feel for that family. And as the mom wheeled that child up, obviously the child was not going to play on the playground. She was just getting, getting him some sun and sat down next to Susie and Susie chatted with her a little bit and she said, you mind if I ask about your son, and she goes, yeah, my son contracted viral meningitis. This is exactly what the doctor is saying. We need to be cautious about with our own daughter. And so it was not the word of faith we needed at the moment. And I remember that night, my dad has, has ministered around the nation for all my life and everything. My dad was, was up in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was 2 in the morning the next night. And I was on my face in that hospital NICU unit. And um, I was weeping right next to my daughter, the only child in the room. I was just weeping next to her while Susie was getting some sleep. It was so late in the night. And the nurse knocked, knocked on the room. The lights were out and it was dark and only you heard the beeps going and everything. And the nurse says, Mr. Mainers, your father is on the line from out of town. And she handed me the uh, the phone and it had this long cord on it. Everybody under 21 will not realize that phones used to have cords on them. Um, but she handed me the long phone cord and everything. And I remember just with my face literally making a puddle of tears. My dad prayed with me from a thousand miles away. And he started speaking life into the situation, speaking faith. In the moment. I mean, I'm, I'm four feet from the machines beeping and the air units pushing air. I, I'm seeing my daughter with more needles in her and this tiny little baby so stuck by just gear and things, equipment. But there, there, there came a moment with his prayer that even though I was seeing the problem, he was speaking faith that got bigger than what I was seeing Amen. in real life. She didn't stand up and unplug everything and go, I feel a lot better, Dad. That wasn't going to be the way the story ended. But somewhere, the way that I thought had to be affected by faith, it had to change in me. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. This is where it all comes down as believers. At some juncture, 
we got to get over the hump of what is and start believing the promise that God has spoken over our situation. Jairus brought his need, not his daughter, his need to Jesus. Now this is interesting because it says he went right to him. He fell on his feet. Jesus always responds to that right posture. He didn't go up there and sound entitled. Jesus, we're on the same team, man. I work for you. I work in the, in the, in the house, man. I'm on your boys. He didn't take that posture. Okay, I've done all my penance now. I'm ready to, I'm ready to go ahead and take all that I'm, I'm owed as a great man of God. And something about Jairus' plea caused Jesus to put his closed sign out and walk away. You want to know if I was the guy next in line with my kid that I wanted prayer for? I'd be pretty torqued. But something about it was so great that Jesus went with him. Shut it down. That would be like me walking right out of this room right now because somebody off the street said, can you come help me fix my tire? And it's at this point the story totally changes and new characters come into the story. The Bible goes on to say, if you kind of put the pause there, the Bible goes on to say uh, that a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there. This is actually the story I'm wanting to tell you. Not even so much Jairus. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. It says she'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, and she spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. We'll suffer through a few things as long as it gets better. Her thing was getting no better. She was probably anemic from bleeding for 12 years. You can only imagine. She, she'd spent everything she had. She'd been to every doctor in the area. One might give a little bit of hope until he has no more answer for her and she moves on to another doctor. So she's spending all of her money. She's spending all of her energy. She's not hearing anything that brings her up. Everything's bringing her down. You can only imagine the mindset that this woman was in. You can only imagine that she probably wasn't full of hope. She probably wasn't necessarily skipping around. She probably wasn't necessarily um, a ray of sunshine all of the time. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. But look what it says here in verse 27. It says, when she heard about Jesus, when she, when she heard about Jesus, you can't hear about Jesus unless somebody's telling you about Jesus. Right? Don't, don't rush past and catch that. You can't hear about him. They, you can't be a hearer unless there's a teller. There was a buzz about what was happening with Jesus. There was a, 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 a word around town. And she came to some point, everything I've heard has been negative. Everything I've heard has been bad news. I've got no other, and I, this Jesus is out in the town square laying hands on me. Maybe he can help me out. And, and this is interesting. As she arrives, imagine the room, totally full, like we were talking earlier. Jesus being in the middle, the crowds pressing in. And she comes in the front door, and she, all she sees is people. The crowd is pressing in, and all she sees is people. She could have very easily moved into the way of thinking that many of us do. Well, Jesus is probably working with much more important situations. Jesus is probably ministering to more important people. Bigger situations. My, my, I just, I'm going to have to just get used to what I, the, the, the hand that I've been dealt in life. 
Sometimes we switch into that mindset and we start thinking, this is just the way life's going to be. My marriage is never going to get better. My financial situation is never going to be any better. Whatever the need is, whatever the moment is, if we start getting into that mode of I'm just going to stay at the, at the outskirts of the crowd, and I believe in Jesus, I see him laying hands on folks in the middle, and blind eyes are being opened. I believe it's true, but it's probably not going to be my story because I'm all the way back here. But the Bible says something so key that we got to catch in this story in the next line. It says this. It says, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can just grab the hem of his garment, something can happen for me. She had to change the way she was thinking from the last doctor's visit. Catch this. It didn't make the problem go away. She was still bleeding as she saw Jesus in the crowd. Everything was still wrong. She still had no money. She still had no good news from the doctors. Everything was wrong at the moment she saw Jesus. But she had to come to a place of, I can change the way that I think, even though I can't change the way that I believe. Now, I don't know exactly what she did to get through the crowd. I don't know if she crawled on her hands and knees and saw kneecaps everywhere. or I don't know if she dropped the shoulder like a good running back. I don't know what she did. But she got herself to that place in the center behind Jesus. And she wouldn't have ever got there if she didn't change the way she thought. Especially about that moment. Basically, paraphrase, she kneels down and she does touch the hem of his garment. And something very supernatural happens. Jesus says, Oh, who touched you? And the disciples are around him, kind of helping him and everything like that. Oh, Jesus, you're tired, you're sweaty, you know, it's a small place and a lot of people, everybody's touching you. And he goes, No, there's something different about this touch. There was a power that went out of me. This touch happened. Something very special and unique happened. That he, he, he's basically saying, I didn't necessarily initiate this, but it came out of me. And I can only imagine Jesus turning around and seeing this woman. She's probably still just looking up at him on her knees. Who knows what just buzzed through her life and her body. But all I know is the bleeding stopped. Her need was over in that moment. If I can, if she thought, if I could just touch the way, touch, touch the hem of his garment. She thought that. She thought that. The Bible is full of stories like this. That in our difficult time, God ministers to us. If you're in a place of worry, you know those tracks have happened in your life. Those things. I got a few things very quickly, and I'll wrap it up with this. A few things, some ways to deal with worry. Number one, gratitude <coughs> offsets worry. Gratitude offsets worry. The, re the renewed mind thinks this way. That they start, you wake up with, with gratitude. You start having a thankful heart. Um, how about this? If God is still pursuing you by His Holy Spirit, you've got a lot to be grateful for. Your breath, your life, your sight, everything. Just, just income. God gives us the ability to create wealth, the Bible says. All those things. Start inventorying the things that God has already done and already blessed you with. Live that lifestyle rather than worry. Number two, encouragement offsets worry. Stock your environment with people that can effectively offer encouragement to your situation. I will not let people into my life who just constantly bring it down. I, I, I have learned to say, you know, I'm not comfortable with this situation or with this conversation. I've learned to say those things. And I want to be that to someone else. You know, you may have a circle around you that seems so negative, And you may not be able to do anything about aunt so-and-so or uncle this guy. 
You may not be able to change their ways or their way of thinking, but you can be different for other folks. You can determine to be a different voice. You can make that. You can be the encouragement. Next one, real quick. Sincere prayer offsets worry. Whether you're praying individually or you're praying with a group, um, bring stuff up to Jesus. Get with Jesus and pray. You're going to kneel somewhere. You're either going to kneel at the feet of the problem solver or you're going to kneel at the feet of the problem. And if you can worry unceasingly, you can pray unceasingly. If you can worry until late at night about something, then pray late at night about something. You are in the driver's seat with this. You're in charge this way. Um, the last thing is this, is faith offsets worry. If you feed your faith, it'll grow. If you feed worry, it deteriorates everything else. This morning, in my own kind of personal devotion, uh, I, I headed toward uh, John chapter 14. And uh, I'll turn there real quick. You don't need to turn there. But John chapter 14 is a verse that I've, I've been around all my life. But knowing I was coming here tonight, knowing what I was going to be speaking on tonight, John 14 1 says, and I, I, this, is, this is the Aaron Maynard's translation real quick. It says, hey! There's a bit of a hay in there. Hey! So Holy Spirit need to get our attention. Hey! Don't let your hearts be troubled. I like that. I, I like I like thinking of it that. Hey! Stop it! <laughs> Quit allowing this to happen. See, we always think we're, we're the victim from the devil and the enemy, and, and he exists. But we have been, it's, been, it's extremely clear in Scripture who we've been called to be and how we've been called to live. We have dominion over him. Yeah. Hey, don't let your heart any longer be troubled. It's the Holy Spirit's way of saying, get over it. ask you minister in each place right now. I don't know exactly who this is for, but I just I, I just I just see a linking together. 
together with worry as it relates to leading right to depression. It, it links it links together, and that depression has been significant. I just be healing that place right now in the name of Jesus. Whoever you are, however it applies. I don't need to know the details, but by the Spirit of God, I have evidence right now. This moment right now is evidence that God has that on his radar. It's proof to you that you're heard. It's heaven using a stranger to let you know that you're on his radar. That's gigantic. The God that created the universe has captured your tears. He has been there for your hopelessness and in that darkness. And it is going to be to his glory that he works in this situation. Your joy is not gone forever. Your joy will be on its way back with a vengeance. It's healing happens in the name of Jesus. 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 Lord, all is for be a moment of, of repentance. There's always a responsibility we have. And if you know you need to repent of allowing that track to continue in your life, then do so now. Just do it now. It's between you and God. Do it. You do it. You do it. Lord, it's now we reach out for you to further build and establish the mind of Christ working in us. Lord, that your promises would be forefront in the way that we think. Scripture would be, Lord, our benchmark. We call out for wisdom like it's promised in James, Lord, and we would think differently, we'd think rightly, we would have applied knowledge alive in our lives. We won't cower or hide in shadows, but Lord, we stand strong in the power of your Spirit. The decisions we make will have your fingerprints all over them. Lord, all of this is so that we can show the world Christ. All of this is so that they would see you in us rather than us in us. And so over every situation, and every person, and every place that the enemy has thought he's created a toehold, God, we just speak life from those situations right now in the name of Jesus. Healing all for your glory. All for your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus'